Welcome to the Bada Boom Podcast. I'm Chris. On today's episode, we have on comics creator Ed Brisson, writer of Predator, Deathstroke Inc., There's Something Wrong with Patrick Todd, and the upcoming Batman Incorporated. Brisson talks about the challenge of striking a balance between the excitement of Big Two work and his own creations. Listen in on our chat. Hey, what's up, Ed? Uh, not too much. And you? Good, good. Excited to talk comics, especially on, on this day because, um, you know, an exciting book came out, Deathstroke, part three of your year one story. And as a Green Arrow fan, I'm really pumped to talk to you about it. Yeah, well, let's, uh, let's talk about it. Yeah, so, uh, you know, Green Arrow <laughs> does Green Arrow things and is able to do... What I love about the issue as a fan of Green Arrow, it reminded me a little bit of... I don't know if you've ever seen the um, the DC animated showcase with him and Black Canary where they're in the no. airport. Oh, it's it's great. It should be on... Um, if you have access to... Um, H- I know you're in Canada, so I don't know if you guys have uh, HBO Max, but... Yeah, we have Crave, which carries a lot of HBO Max stuff. I think it's a part of the Shazam Black Adam shorts okay. collection of shorts. It's really good. It's it it showcases kind of like why, you know, Oliver is such a great character and, and fun. But it was cool to see him in this issue go, you know, toe-to-toe with Deathstroke. So how fun was it to kind of put that issue together? Uh, this issue was, it was a ton of fun. It, uh, you know, my editor, when he sent it back, you know, when he, he read it, uh, described it as like, being uh, it reminding him of the raid, I guess, which you know I ha- wasn't necessarily my intention going in, but I could definitely see the the comparison. Uh, the raid is an incredible film, so yeah, I just wanted to do like this is supposed to be a, a Deathstroke year one, so this is his first encounter with any sort of cape, uh, with any sort of you know superhero, and uh, I wanted to do something that was more street level, you know, to keep it sort of grounded and uh, really just. Uh, give Deathstroke the opportunity to face someone like he's never faced before. And again, because it's a year one, this is him sort of meeting a challenge and sort of beating it, I guess, or, or trying to beat it, which I, I just thought it was an interesting matchup. Like these two, you know, Deathstroke is, uh, you know, modern day Deathstroke is, is pretty incredible, but, you know, he's just starting out. And so he's still yeah. figuring this stuff out. He obviously has a ton of military experience, but this is, you know, just months with having these sort of new powers he has. And so I really wanted to, Give it something to give him something to test against. I didn't want to go as big as as Superman or anything like that. You know, I thought, you know, a nice gram level character, and I think or a street level character, and I think, you know, I didn't want to go Batman. That seemed like just like too obvious a direction to take it. So Green Arrow is just a character I love. So it felt like it felt like the perfect the perfect matchup. No, and you know, I think what's great about comics, I think we always kind of put those matchups in our head and. You know, a year one story is always interesting because you're able to kind of, you know, take a step back. You know, he's not the Deathstroke that has like the ultimate, the the best assassin in the world. You know, he hasn't taken on, you know, the Justice League single-handedly yet. So what's it like to write a year one story with a character that's so established and and be able to kind of add your own little flavor to it? It's interesting. It's a little bit tough because, you know, before jumping into it, I went back and reread like hundreds of Deathstroke comics, you know, like just yeah. everything that was available and tried to sort of make sense of his origin as it's sort of been established over the years and try and sort of, you know, weave something that that made sense given everything that we know about him. But also I think, you know, like he is these days sort of like a, you know, obviously he's the world's greatest assassin. He's this sort of criminal mastermind. He can think mm-hmm. 10 times faster than everyone else, et cetera. But, you know, I... uh I think doing this where he's sort of still, you know, for lack of a better term, has like his training wheels on a little bit. He's still just figuring it out. He's still screwing up. And this that's a part I think is the most interesting about a character is when they sort of, when they're messing up, when they're screwing up, when they're just trying to figure out and they haven't got it all together. And that's very much where he's at at this point. He's just trying to figure out everything that's happened to him, why it's happened to him. Uh, he's trying to use these new skills to sort of establish himself as a, uh, as a, a, a contract killer. And so, yeah, I think it's just it's it's just an interesting take to to have him screwing up and have him really just trying to figure this stuff out, and that's the sort of stuff I just really like to really like to write and really like to play around with. And I could see that too, like, and also reading, you know, another recent book put out was um, Predator, and what I liked about Predator too was that, you know, you have this history, you have the movies, you have the Dark Horse comics, but very much that issue was so 
different than anything that had been established, like in terms of like the type of story. When I read it, I didn't quite expect what was going on, especially with the two stories going at the same time and then them kind of intersecting. Like when you are kind of like plotting out your stories, especially like an issue one, like Predator or, you know, a big story like an origin of a of Deathstroke, like what's that like? Uh, it's it's different for every project. Yeah. Uh, you know, for Deathstroke, it took a lot more, I think, research, digging in and, and sort of just trying to figure out you know, where he's at at that time in his life and how, you know, and, and how we sort of navigate around where he is and sort of build him up. Because, you know, there are some stories that show him being like a brilliant soldier back in the day, which, you know, he's supposed to be a brilliant soldier, but he, like, this this operation nearly killed him, right? It, mm-hmm. The experiment nearly killed him. So it kind of leaves him at initially a bit of a disadvantage, which obviously he, he, he comes back from. Predator was a different one in that uh, uh, growing up, I was a massive Predator fan. You know, I saw it at the drive-in for the first time when it came out. You know, I've been on podcasts defending Predator 2. So I, <laughs> I'm pretty, you know, up to, um, you know, I, I know Predator quite well. And so when I was offered Predator, I think I had, a, like, I had to pitch into them for it the next morning. And normally when I have to write a pitch for something new, it takes me about two weeks. I'll go off and I'll research and do all that sort of stuff. But Predator, like they they asked me to do it. And I basically had an idea ready to go. It was like a, an idea that had been kicking around in my head for years. And and that is largely what you see on the page, the the idea that I, I pitched them the next day. So yeah, it's pitching a number one, pitching, you know, an origin story, anything like that. It all depends on the property. Some of them, it's like pulling teeth, trying to get like, to try and find like an angle that feels fresh, that feels unique, that feels a little bit different. And sometimes it just like pop in your head to full form. And uh, that was the case with Predator. Deathstroke was a lot more research intensive and uh, and a lot of sort of mapping things out and writing and rewriting my outline until it got to a place where I was satisfied with it. I don't know why you would have to defend Predator 2. As a 90s kid, I (laughs) I had only seen Predator 2 up until like I was a teenager (laughs) it was always on tv here and stuff like that and you know the ending I was always waiting for that sequel (laughs) because I was like I was like hey like are they ever gonna continue that plot thread and stuff like that and the same thing happened with me with with Ghostbusters too people used to always like when I was a kid that like people will hate on it I'm like it's always on tv it's the one I've seen (laughs) and then I see the original I was like oh I kind of get it if I had expectations I, I guess maybe it wouldn't have quite lived up to it, but I still think it's awesome. I still like Predator 2, uh, but I won't uh, deny that it uh, it does have some issues. You know, Danny Glover's character in particular is a little bit too much of a cliche pastiche of, like, cops uh, to the point where he doesn't really have, like, a really clearly defined character. He feels yeah. like just like just a stitched together thing. Uh, there's a lot of stuff I like in it. So, you know, like I said, I... I I think it's imperfect for sure, but there's definitely a lot of stuff I like, and I think it pushed a lot of, uh, it it added a lot of interesting stuff to the Predator mythology. Yeah, and like talking about like adding a lot, like obviously this is huge because, you know, this is the first first time Marvel is kind of, you know, putting their imprint on the Predator comics. And, and what's that like being, you know, that writer to kind of bring it over, especially with how well established, you know, and how well regarded those Dark Horse books were? Uh, honestly, I just tried not to think about it. <laughs> I just tried to put my head down and work and really like, that's, that's the sort of stuff that like can drown you if you, if you get too caught up with it. Like, uh, so my, my plan with that sort of stuff is always just like, put your head down, just try and do the best, uh, try and create the best story that I, that I would want to read and hope that, you know, that, that then translates to what uh, other folks uh, want to see in the comic. With Predator, you, Obviously, you're creating new characters that haven't been in the universe. Also established, seeing different things like, you know, predators having hunting routes and kind of adding all of that, like in terms of what what you have planned for that book and, and those characters in the book, what's that going to look like? So I, I can't get too deep into it. It's mm. just like uh, spoiler wise yeah. and just secret plans. But yeah, the the hope is really to build data up to be this, this sort of like... Um, you know, this this sort of well, sort of predator feared, like it's someone who's feared by the predator. So like yeah. this incredible hunter of predator and really just build her up to be someone who can, 
bring us into that world who then we can learn more about the predators uh, through her and, and someone who is sort of a legitimate ongoing threat rather than I think in, in the movies and the books, we normally see like someone for one story comes in, you know, mm. and we don't really have a lot of uh, picking up past threads in, in any of the uh, films. So hopefully this is someone who has a little bit of staying power and, and sticks around for a while, provided you know, she doesn't get killed in this first arc. Uh, <laughs> maybe she does. I'm not going to like spoil it. No, that's cool. You know, um, and I've really loved, um, you know, Philip Kennedy Johnson's take on, on Alien, kind of that anthology, you know, going in arcs and stuff. Obviously, you're focusing on building data. But, you know, what I always loved about like Predator movies, even though like some of them may have not been like great, is that they always try to add a wrinkle to it. You know, there's sure. always like a little something, you know, even the Shane Black one, you kind of had some some elements where you're like, oh, that would have been interesting if the rest of the movie was good. <laughs> or um, even Predators, where you kind of have, you know, that that hunting ground on the Predator planet and stuff. I know you try not to get, like, too wrapped up into it, but, you know, how fun is it to to be able to kind of, like, create these, these new characters and universes you love? Oh, it's an absolute blast. Like I said, I grew up a massive Predator fan. You know, in elementary school, before there was really a term for it, I would write, you know, Predator stories uh, as a kid. So, you know, the fact that I'm an adult now and it's my job to actually write these stories that I, I used to fantasize about as a kid, it's, it's just absolutely, it's incredible. It's hard to really put it into words, but, uh, you know, I feel, I feel lucky as hell. And with that kind of, it's dope that you're getting like all these really great, like big two opportunities and, and working on these big characters. But, you know, how's that translated with, with your creator own work? You know, something, you know, I love that, you know, recently came out. There's something wrong with Patrick Todd. Like, I love that first issue. And I think what I have liked about your writing, you know, especially with the issues I've kind of come across is how you're able to introduce a world, a character and kind of live leave that little ending at the end to kind of be like, oh, there's there's so much more going on and kind of like is able to hook. And I, and I think sometimes that can get lost in some books that come out. But how do you keep, you know, a little bit of, of the creative juices in the tank for for that stuff, you know? For the creator own stuff, you mean? Yeah. Yeah. I So I, uh, starting out years ago, I, I started self-publishing comics and I self-published comics for a very, very long time where I wrote and I drew and I, I lettered, I colored them all. From about 94 until 2010, I was self-publishing just my own stuff. And, and so that's just a, sort of my background and what I, like, it, it's the stuff that sort of drives me is doing creator on work. And when I broke into comics, you know, the what got put me on Marvel's radar and DC's radar was a series I used to write uh, that I, I come back to periodically called Murder Book, which is a bunch of short crime stories uh, that I did with various artists. And then when I first broke into the industry, you know, I, I did like five or six books in Image uh, before sort of jumping over and doing some stuff at Marvel and DC. Uh, but I did have like a, I guess, a five-year period where I was just working at Marvel and I didn't get to sort of really do any creator-owned work. Uh, there was a couple of creator-owned books that, that were planned, that were ready to go, but just time-wise, it just didn't work out. And so it, it's one of those things where when the pandemic hit, the work dried out for a little bit. I realized like I needed to, I needed to do it. I needed to get back to it. I needed to start writing creator own stuff again. And so, you know, we did Beyond the Breach and then there's something wrong with Patrick Todd. And I think right now I have like four or five other books like in various stages of development. Uh, some will be announced soon that'll be coming out and some are just in the stages where we're kind of walking around the publishers to see see who's interested and who's not. But yeah, it's, that's the stuff that really drives me most. I think it's doing the like creator owned. And that's not to, uh, knocking, it's a big two. I love doing big two work mm -hmm. as well. But uh, I feel like being able to do whatever, you know, whatever I want, you know, whatever the artist and I want to do, there's a, there's a lot of uh, freedom in there. It just feels great. Yeah. And talk about a little, like the inspiration between um, there's something wrong with Patrick Todd. It, it seems like very like intimate. It has a, that crime element, you know, also that sci fi thriller a little bit as well it's it's interesting because that first issue has so many different threads going in it and um at the end you know there's a character zeus that's revealed again it's something where i'm like i want to know who that guy is yeah, sure. <laughs> um so like what's the inspiration behind that story and what can people expect from the issues ahead so i've been trying to figure out what the inspiration behind patrick todd was and i honestly don't know it's just an idea <laughs> that sort of came to me one day when i was out walking the dogs 
And I, you know, I just came home and sort of jotted it down and then started building on it. And it was uh, initially just the idea. The initial idea was like about a kid who just goes to catch a predator on, you know, uh, these guys and, and uh, who are criminals and he makes them rob banks because he can, you know, sort of telepathically force them to do this. And then it, does, it started building around there. Like what, what would be the consequences of him doing this? What, how does that affect the life around him? How does it affect him as a person and his ability to like, sort of empathize with people if he can just make them do whatever he wants? And so we started, uh, you know, building the story around that. And uh, yeah, just kind of got like, I, I don't want to say too much about Zeus and like yeah. where he comes from and, and, and how he figures into everything because I will spoil some stuff. But, you know, he's, he was part of that initial thought process. You know, like, I think the thing that I like is that Patrick thinks that he's alone in this world doing this, and, and other people are definitely catching on to who he is and what he is. And so, yeah, I just it was just a thing where I had this idea and just kept sort of playing around with it for about a year, I think, and until I started approaching artists. Uh, you know, Gavin is someone who I uh, met back in 2017 at Heroes Con. I always really liked his artwork and reached out and he happened to be free at the time. So we sort of pitched this thing together and, and managed to uh, get Aftershock to, uh, to take it from us. But I think, I think I dance around your question. I'm not sure if I, I answered mean, that's, I think maybe. You've done a couple podcasts. That's fair. I, <laughs> it was a good attempt on my end, but you are a professional. So that's uh, why uh, you do this. But, you know, I, it felt like, um, like you said, when, when he feels alone in that world, it kind of felt like, you know, a little bit like Jumper. And, you know, in the beginning of the movie where he's he's robbing banks and he's he's thinking like, oh, like, I'm alone in this world. There's really no consequences. Obviously, it's not as fun as that. You know, he has his mom away, but there's obviously in that movie, there's a lot more to that world. And I definitely got that vibe from this where it's like, oh, like, he's got these powers, but there's there's definitely a world behind it. Like, there's a why. There's yeah, for sure. Yeah. And, and we get into that as we as we move forward, you know, like the with the second issue, we're just trying to sort of bring everyone together, I guess. And then, yeah, uh, the third issue is when we're, we're going to find out some, some pretty devastating stuff about uh, Patrick's life uh, that he is not even aware of. Uh, that's really going to sort of set him on the path uh, that he follows through the rest of the series. And you, you talked about kind of like kicking into high gear, a lot of the, um, the creator own stuff. Is there anything in particular that you're really excited about kind of coming up might be already solicited or close to being solicited? So the only thing coming out that I think I can talk about is, uh, the, is Batman Incorporated. So I'm writing Batman Incorporated for DC and it's a new sort of version of the team that's run by Ghostmaker. Batman hands control over Tim because Batman's now essentially broke or you yeah. know, broke it. She's like rich person broke. Yeah. yeah. Um, <laughs> but he It's like the, in White Chicks when they're like, we're like, oh, how poor are we? Are we Martha Stewart broke or uh, MC Hammer yes. broke? <laughs> uh, so he, uh, so Ghostmaker uh, is running the team. He's taken on Clown Hunter, who's sort of, you know, uh, his Robin, I guess, although they would disagree with that. Uh, trying to train him up as a, as a, just trying to train Clown Hunter in general because uh, mm -hmm. Clown Hunter lacks any sort of training, and, and Bruce is worried that he's going to get himself killed, mm -hmm. you know. And we've got uh, a pretty cool team that is investigating the first issue. Essentially, Ghostmaker and Batman's past mentors, so they both trained under the same mentors uh, coming up, or a lot of the same mentors, and those mentors are being killed. And so they're, Ghostmaker's trying to figure out who's killing his past mentors and why. And it feels like something that's very much directed at either him or Batman. And they're trying to sort of get to the bottom of that. And uh, it takes him uh, in some very interesting directions, I think, that reveals a lot of stuff about Ghostmaker's past that he's not necessarily revealed to others that uh, is going to have some detrimental effects on uh, the team's faith in him. Which I probably said too much. And I know I've kept it vague, <laughs> but like, you know. It's a lot of fun. And John Timms is on art, and he's absolutely just been destroying it. Just, uh, it's a beautiful book to look at. And uh, it's been a lot of fun to write. I'm already, like, I think about five or six issues into writing, and uh, it's just been an absolute blast. Yeah, and that's got to be fun, too, especially a character like Ghostmaker that is so new, you know, obviously has their fans, but, you know, there's, there's so much of, of their history that hasn't been explored. 
That's um, right. And and also, you know, in terms of this would kind of be like the first book where where they're highlighted. You know, they've they've been in Batman, they've been in backup stories or or one shots and stuff. But what's it like to kind of shed some light on areas that you know fans haven't seen, but also kind of like again work with the artists like Tim's and 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 be able to be like, hey, like just just go crazy do you know let's see him swing a sword <laughs> yeah it's great because you know i'm not you know with a lot of stuff you're sort of bogged down by continuity and you have to take that in consideration and with ghostmaker and con on the boat there's not a ton of continuity that you have to really worry about so it's really cool that you can add to it and you can build upon it and not have to worry about like sort of satisfying you know 50 or 60 years worth of someone's comic book reading uh and by you know sort of doing something that's you know not keeping with with something they did 40 years ago so that's been a lot of fun it's been really freeing and it's been really it's been interesting to try and add to ghostmaker's past mythology because he is a character quite secretive and doesn't tend to share uh you know he doesn't even show his face i think he's only shown his face to like three people if i remember correctly and uh so it's really interesting to sort of you've got to like almost pull his history out from him and his past, and it's a lot of fun. And and other people are working with him too. You know, uh, I think he's appeared in, he's appearing in another book right now where it sort of covers a lot of his training in the past. And you know, obviously James Tynan did a ton of stuff with him. That was a lot of fun, and is you know he really sort of built the base of the character that uh, it's been a lot of fun to play around. with. If I say if I say it's been a lot of fun one more time, just smack. Me the... <laughs> no, it's it, it's great. I mean, obviously, like you know, you want to give give fans. That's the great part about reading comic books, especially with the the episodic nature of them. You know, they they could go on, and you kind of want to save those reveals for that. You know, that last page. You know, or sure, yeah. you know those things. Those are really important, and and kind of give you know the reader something. But it's also good to like know what what the process is like. You know, I think sometimes it gets lost that, you know, creators are fans too, that they can have a lot of fun, <laughs> that they can, you know, talk about these things and, you know, be excited about getting on a book like Batman Inc. or, you know, fulfill a lifelong dream of, of getting on the Predator book. So say as, it's been a lot of fun as many times as you want. All right, all right, fair <laughs> enough. No, but in, and for me, like, it, it's always cool to see, you know, creators get those opportunities and stuff because, for me, like when I get to see those things solicited, like a new Predator book or a Batman Inc. book, or get to read like Deathstroke Year One and see him not be as tidied up as he's been for, for years, you know, taking on the league by himself or the Teen Titans by himself, but being, you know, literally like destroyed by <laughs> Oliver is cool to see those things. So, and that's why we, you know, me and my friend Troy started the podcast to, to kind of, you know, talk with creators and, and, and find out what that process is like because we do love the stories. Awesome. And um, in terms of like with Predator, obviously that's a big project and stuff. What I was curious about, like, is there being that the the film just came out, Prey, and obviously mm -hmm. like when the book came out, we had a lot of variant covers for various Marvel titles and stuff. Like, what is the the process editorial with the team? Do you get a lot of notes, or was there something that they felt needed to, the book needed to be? Honestly, I've been fairly lucky in that a lot of the notes have been really light notes. Um, I think the the biggest one is initially my first arc was five issues and, and the editor suggested we, we make it six, you know, to get uh, some more time with uh, some of the characters and some of the, some of the bigger moments. But uh, yeah, it's been pretty... Pretty, a pretty easy process. I'll, I'll be honest, you know, like uh, the the thing I do like about working on the book a lot is Kev Walker on art is uh, he's an incredible artist. But uh, I'll you know often when I write scripts, uh, especially when I'm writing like a, you know big fight scenes or whatever, I'll have a sort of a caveat at the beginning that like you know this is how I see it, but if there's another way they want to take it and uh, to go nuts, and, and Kev is someone who will definitely take advantage of that and 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 sort of choreograph fights and stuff in a way that's super exciting. So even like the opening for the first Predator book, I'd staged the fight slightly differently. And then he came in and he had this like, you know, he has uh, this really kind of cool, like almost a countdown where the panels, it starts and each page is one less panel until you get to the that big splash, which I think worked like just beautifully. I think it was incredible the way he did it. 
but uh, yeah, it's, I feel like just everyone's sort of been firing on all cylinders here and, and just sort of trying to create the best possible Predator book uh, that we can. And editorial has been great. 20th Century Fox, who gives notes, have been really great in that. And uh, yeah, it's been, the whole process has been really smooth. Uh, other than the fact that it was delayed by about a year, <laughs> everything else was has been a very, very smooth process. Yeah, I mean, even though it got delayed, it kind of came out at the perfect time. I was like, did sure. it this? Because, you know, you had the the um, Prey come out. It, it seemed like it gave it a lot of space. You know, um, Alien is on a bit of a, a hiatus, so it's kind of like it has its moment, you know. Right, it's for like sure. It's able to be spotlighted. And especially, like, I think, was it originally, like, in October of last year or July of last year? July of last year, yeah. Yeah, um, I think it, it definitely, like, you know, it feeds into it, especially, you know, having a female protagonist, like those things kind of, you know, play hand in hand with the movie, even though yeah, you know, it was they're very different that, stories. And that was very interesting because I pitched this story almost two years ago, I think this month. And so it was interesting when when I found out what Prey was going to be about, which it was originally back then called Skull or Skulls, I can't recall. Mm-hmm. Um, and finding out that it was, you know, like a predator story set, you know, several hundred years in the, in the past with female protagonists. Who like there there are these weird sort of similar like opposing similarities almost yeah. you know like uh, that wasn't planned. I'd started writing you know mine before I knew what the book what the the film was going to be about, and didn't find out what the film was about. I think until I you know was on the second issue or something. Uh, so I, yeah, it, it's a it's a weird bit of synchronicity that I think uh, was kind of neat to see. Yeah, I wonder if the the executives read your script or like. Yeah, we should probably wait for the movie to come out. <laughs> yeah, who knows? Uh, yeah, that's above my pay grade. But uh, yeah, yeah I'm, I'm not complaining. You know, I know uh, the movie came out and thankfully it seems to be doing quite well. It's a good movie. You know, I got to see it finally about a week ago. So yeah, I, I'm happy for all this sort of predator synchronicity. I'm, I'm down with it. Yeah, that's awesome. But congrats on, on everything. Like I said, it's, it's awesome to see the amount of books you, you've been able to put out, um, especially leaving that space to to do those things like your creator own work. And it's great to hear you kind of still working on that because it's very easy to kind of um, just take on more things and just be like, you know, because comics, it's hard. So it's easy to kind of be like, take on more work, more of the big two things. But yeah, I think you always kind of have to leave stuff for yourself. You know, how can you give more than you take <laughs> for sure and actually like a, a funny thing about that is uh i realized that just before the pandemic and i had, had a chat with marvel where i was like i need to cut back a little bit because I, well, I was working a lot mm-hmm. uh, and and that was so i could go work on creator on as well like so mm-hmm. i i had been planning already to cut back when the pandemic hit and the pandemic was just like well we're not going to give you a choice. Yeah. Um, <laughs> like we made the choice for you. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So, uh, but it's good. You know, like I said, I, I, I spent a lot of the pandemic sort of cooking up pitches and stuff and, you know, if things go, go well on all these pitches we're working on then you know, it's going to be a ton and ton of greater on coming out for me in the next uh, year, year and a half and, and beyond hopefully. Yeah, there's just going to have a whole, like, Ed Brisson shelf at the LCSs. Yeah. I'll, I'll, I'll take it, yeah. <laughs> well, thanks, man. And uh, with that, bada boom. Bada boom. Thank you for listening to the Bada Boom podcast. Keep the conversation going on Instagram, TikTok, and Twitter. Get in the comments on our YouTube channel and let us know what you'd like to hear next. And please subscribe to the podcast on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, and wherever you listen. 